All right. Let's get this thing going. Oh, they killed you guys at first service, man. It was jam-packed, man. We had people standing in the back and all that, man. But you guys look good, though, too. Y'all look good. Appreciate y'all. The time change didn't, didn't influence you guys, but first service was, was busy. Um, so it looks good. I'm happy to see I see some of my friends out here, man. See my, hey, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> I like seeing my people, man. Just, I like seeing my people, man. Just, I love that, man. Uh, listen, so I know we have been going through this series about, about faith, and I, I love this series. This has been a, an awesome series that we've had the opportunity to go through because I feel like where we're at right now just in life is like we really need faith. And I think it's one of those things that for a lot of believers, we actually don't know what, what faith is. And this has really been a great opportunity for us to learn. And so if you haven't been following along, I, I encourage you to go back on YouTube and check out the previous messages because they've been, they've been awesome. And I hope that by the end of this thing that we see our faith grow. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about giving by faith and walking by faith. And this week we're going to talk about uh, tested faith, right? And I feel like every single time that I get called on to, to preach, my faith is always tested, always. I, I mean, you guys have, I don't think I've ever been sick this much in my life ever. Like, I'm, I was a really healthy kid and an adult because we were broke, and so we just couldn't go. So my parents were like, don't get sick. And so, <laughs> so we didn't, you know, just out of respect for my parents, we didn't get sick. But like, now, like, since I've been here, like, bro, I got shingles. Like, what young man is getting shingles, right? I mean, like, that should be Joe, not me. <laughs> like, so here I am getting, getting shingles and stuff, right? And so, you know, and so this week I got food poisoning, so like leading all the way into this, I'm food poisoning, like, you know, I threw out my back once, and it's like, this is, this is tough business, man. This is a hard field to work in, but I feel like when it comes to tests, nobody does tests better than, than America. Like, we love tests. We do. Like, when I was in kindergarten, it was super easy. It was like shapes, sounds, colors, basics. Now, there's like studying for the SATs in kindergarten. You know, they're doing calculus in kindergarten. It's amazing. <laughs> But, like, you know, like we have a test for everything, right? Like, you know, like we have a, a find your spiritual gift test. That's a good one. You know, personality tests. Those are okay because, you know, you can lie your way through those. You know, they have like a who's your Disney princess test, right? Or the which dog is best for me. We did that one when we got our husky. That's how we found out because we took the test. And you even got to do the test now when you want to get into your bank account like I did the other day. You got to take a test to prove that you're not a robot. Like, all we do is test, right? But then it seems like as soon as we go through a test in our faith, all of a sudden, it, we get all down, right? Why are we going through this? I don't understand, God. It's not fair. But, like, we know we're supposed to have trials and stuff. This isn't anything new. I think the biggest trial, where are my parents at? Parents, put your hands. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think we go through the hardest test with kids. And, and <laughs> my man, listen, I had kids at a young age, and, and I don't, I'm not recommending that, but I love talking to couples who are like, you know, they're like, oh, you know, we're just waiting until we have the perfect job, and we're making the right amount of money, and then we get the right house, and then we're going to go ahead and settle down and have kids. I'm like, yo, best luck to you, bro. Like, you are going to be tired. You're not going to have any energy, no stamina, but you do you. Right? But then, like, on, on the flip side, like, you got the young people, like myself. I had all the energy and stamina in the world. I was broke. I didn't have nothing for them kids. So, so then I know that there's somebody out there right now, like, well, there's a happy medium PMC. No, there's not. There's not an age where you're like, this is a perfect age. You got energy and I got resources. You ain't got no knowledge. You don't know about no kids. Let me tell you something, man. Kids suck, bro. Like, kids, <laughs> like, kids are just different, man. Like, kids... Like, it takes a special place in our heart to, like, to raise kids, right? Because what somebody is doing is they're coming to you and saying, yo, here's a human being. Raise them into a good citizen and extra points if you can get them saved. Extra points. And it's like, yo, keep it. I don't even want that test. So we accept it because this is what we do. We're glutton for punishment. We accept this test. And we're like, you know, these kids, like, you know, you're dealing with the sleepless nights. You know, our son was very colicky, so, you know, we had to deal with that. And I was like, you know, you have these things that make you not want to have no more kids. But then somebody's like, let's take another test while we're taking this test. Okay, and you have another kid. 
And you think like, I'm doing a math test, the next one's math. No, no, this is an English test here now, right? Because these kids are not the same at all, man. They're not the same at all. And like, then you're just like, yo, man, kids suck. And you don't get any better at it, bro. Like, it doesn't matter if you end up having five kids, all five of those kids suck. I promise, all right? Like, I'm one of three, and like, we all suck, bro. And like, I have three. They all suck, bro. So, like, today, as we're talking about Abraham, we're going to talk about, we're going to get to the point where everybody likes, you know, we talk about Abraham being willing to sacrifice Isaac. But I want to give you guys his faith walk and how we get there, all right? And so, just for the reading of the word of the Lord, we're just going to go ahead and rise. I've got a little bit of reading I got to do, but you guys just bear with me. All right, so by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. We'll go further down. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And who he had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did not receive, he did receive him back. It's the word of the Lord. You guys go ahead and grab a seat. Abraham's got an awesome story. Like, he's just, I mean, he is like, he's the father of the faith, right? And Abraham, he is a very respected man amongst Christians, Jews, and Muslims. Everybody respects Abraham. He's that guy. But I want to be real clear as we read about Abraham and anybody in Scripture that we find a way to apply this to our lives. I think one thing, because we do so much reading, we love knowledge so much, is that we read the Bible like a history book sometimes. You know, like you read a history book, and it's really just a bunch of significant events happening, some dates, some people, and, and that's it. And that's why I love history, because it's super easy. It never changes. But when it comes to the Bible, this is a living word here, right? And in the Jewish culture, they use this, especially the Torah, as a manual for life. How do we live? How do we get down? What should I do? How do I apply this? So I want you guys to find ways, this in your personal reading time and today, to find ways to apply this to your life. All right, now Abraham, he pulls up on the scene in Genesis 12. All right, and we don't know much about him before that, but we know his dad dies at the end of chapter 11. All right, and so we jump into chapter 12, and it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make a great, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. That's, there's a lot going on here. And I love this story because the first thing we see, it, the last thing we see is that it says Abraham was 75 years old. I think if ever there's a time in your life that you deserve to be set in your ways, it's when you're 75 years old. Like, you've done it all. You're good. Like, chill. Just go through the rest of your life and just be easy. But God's like, I'm getting started with you now. Like, I'm just now, I want to get you going. And he's like, and, and on top of that, move. Like, I, said, I can't even use you here. Like, move. Like, I mean, I was 34 when I moved here, and it was like, man, I don't even know. Like, I should, we should reconsider. It's across the country. I don't know. But, man, this guy is 75 years old, and God's like, yo, I got something for you. Let's get, let's get it popping. And so the first thing he did, he's like, yes, I'm going to do it. And he goes, and his, his heart is there. The faith is there. His obedience is a little sus because he was told not to bring anybody with him, Right? And he grabs Lot. And we know for a fact, if you guys know about Lot, right, Lot was nothing but trouble every step of the way. You know, Lot was picking the land that was better. And, you know, we had to go in a, you know, rescue mission on, you know, get Lot. There's a lot of stuff we had to do with this guy, right? So, like, nothing good came from that. But he was really passionate about it. We got to get there to that point. From there, they go and they get there to the land that God has called for them. The Lord drives people out. And he's like, all right, God, you got it. And we have this faith, right, like that God's going to take care of us in the big picture. Like, yo, God said he's got us. He said, you know, we're going to be a great nation, all this and that. And then a famine hits the land. And he's like, man, you know what? Maybe he's thinking God can't handle this. Maybe he's thinking that this is this small enough where I can take this off of God's plate for him. And I know we never do that. 
we never do that. We never think that this is too small and insignificant for God. So they decide, let's take a trip to Egypt. Let's go get some food. And we know that that trip produces nothing but trouble. They get down there. Abraham's like, yo, this is actually my sister, not my wife. You get to doing some lying. Pharaoh's like, yo, y'all got to dip. Like, you guys can't be here. And then they bring some people back with them too, right? Like, who end up causing problems a little bit later. So now we're about 10 years into this faith walk, and we're still being tested. And Abraham's looking, and he's going, you know, God said we was going to be a great, he's going to make a great nation, and that means we're going to have some kids. But I'm 85 years old now. And he's looking at Sarah like, I mean, you're not getting no younger. You're 75, right? And so she's like, you're right, but maybe the promise isn't about me. Maybe it's about, about you. And so maybe we got to find a way to get you a kid, all right? And this is a setup, and he, he failed the test, all right? This is the, the test in the test. That's this right here, right? So she's like, so what we'll do is, you know, we'll just bring in my, my servant. You guys can lay down, and then when you guys have the kid, then it'll be our kid, and we can just work it from there. And we do that sometimes, right? And I walk like we will force the promise. They didn't have any more faith, and they got a little doubtful, and they started to say, maybe we can help God along in this process. You know, God's got a lot of stuff going on. Maybe we can help him. And we do that sometimes, right? Like God would be like, you know, he said, like, he's going to bring you a nice person to marry, and then you just start like, you know what? God's busy. He's got billions of people he's got to take care of. I'm going to just go ahead and go for this guy right here. That ain't it, chief. That ain't it. But you go for it, right? And now you're stuck with this guy that is just no good, and you're trying to, you know, get him to live right because you just couldn't wait. And so we don't ever want to make any promises in the flesh. We want those promises to be spiritual promises that God promises us, right? So Ishmael is born from this. And it was all bad from the moment of conception, all right? It started bad, and still to this day, it's bad. Ishmael is still causing problems today. It hasn't changed yet. And so he was 86 years old when his son was born. And I love Abraham because he's making these rookie mistakes. He's like us, guys. He's like us. Uh, it's kind of a blessing and a curse because it's like, that means we're still going to be messing up when we're 85. So, I mean, <laughs> ladies, you're just going to have to deal with us, right? Like, that's how it's just going to be. But... Yes. <laughs> My man gets it. He understands at a young age, we're just going to be making mistakes, you know? And so he's 86. He's got this kid. And now he's thinking, okay, this, this has got to be it. And then it's like he quickly finds out this ain't it. So another, you know, 13, 14 years goes by. And now Isaac shows up on the scene. This is the promise. This is what God said I had in store for you. You had to take the detour, right? And so, but now we got there took 25 years to get there. 25 years. He's in, this, he's in this test for 25 years. He made some mistakes along the way. We all do. But he stayed faithful. What I love is that as you read through his story, he's always building these altars to God. His relationship with the Lord kept going even in the midst of these tests. All right, and then we get to the fun part where all you guys have been, been waiting for. All right, so we get to Genesis chapter 22, and I got to do some reading here, so y'all bear with me. All right, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him. This time he's supposed to bring people with him, so he's okay. And his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took his hand from the fire. He took his hand and in his hand, he took the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together, and Isaac said to his father, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And, and he, really, he really believed that. Um, so they went, both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order 
and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Whew. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. I know that's a lot. But I love what it says about who he is because the way that we look at it sometimes, we look and we say, oh, you know, Isaac was little, you know, and then some people think he's like a teenager. But the Jewish commentators, they believe that he was about 25 years old. And so when I look at this, I go, okay, so he's 50 years into this journey now. 50 years ago when he was 75, God says, I got a promise for you. And then it takes him 25 years to get to the promise, just to, just to receive it. And then it takes him 20, 25 years with the promise, and now God says, give it back. And his response was, okay. It says that Abram, Abraham rose early in the morning. It doesn't say that he slept in as late as he could. It doesn't say that he tinkered around doing stuff until there was nothing else to do. He didn't argue with God. He didn't go and try to find Ishmael so he can, you know, sacrifice him instead. He was like, I'm going to do this. He got up early in the morning just like he would any other time. His heart posture stayed exactly the same. He had seen God get him through so much in 50 years that it was like, you got it. And God comes with this request that he usually comes to us with, and we hate it. And you look at it, and he says, it's like he's stabbing him every time. He's like, take your son. Boom, your only son Isaac, boom, whom you love, boom, and offer him there, boom, as a burnt offering, boom. And it's just every time it's deeper and deeper and deeper. And in 22 chapters, because we're in chapter 22 here of the Bible, this is the first mention of of this this kind of love. This is the first time that we see it here, 22 chapters deep. But Abraham's posture is the posture that we want to have when we go through trials, because what we see him do is when he gets there, when they get, you know, they're getting all the stuff, the wood, he goes, here, Isaac, you take the wood, I'm going to get the fire stuff and the knife. And he takes everything to the top of the mountain. We probably just would have left the knife at the bottom. But he didn't. You know, could be like, oh, man, sorry, God, my bad. I, I left the knife. I got to go back down and get it. And, you know, if I can find it, you know, I'll, I'll see. And so, but he brings everything with him. And he's tell, even, he even tells the servants, he tells them that the boy and I, we're going to go worship, and then we'll both come back to you. That's his level of faith. He's like, I don't know how God's going to do this. I don't know how he's going to work this thing out. doesn't really matter because he said that he was going to do this. And up until this point of chapter 22 in the Bible, we've never seen anybody raised from the dead. We haven't seen it. But he was, he was so fixated in his walk with the Lord. He had so much faith that he said, look, God made a promise. I've seen God do so much over the years that I know for a fact that even if I got to take my son's life, God's just going to bring him back because he said that the offspring are going to be coming through Isaac. So God, you're just going to have to really come through. And it wasn't a lip service thing. He wasn't saying these things where it was like, maybe I can convince God if I say some really good stuff. And I know that we never do that. Like, we never try to, you know, manipulate God with our words. Oh, man, God, if you do this, I'll never do that again. Mm -mm. We say those things thinking that it's going to make a difference. He meant this stuff when he said it. He meant it. He said, you know, we're coming back down the mountain. Two of us are going up. Two of us are coming down. And he meant that. So the question that we start to ask ourselves is, then how do we get to that point? How do we learn to grow while our faith is being tested? How do we get there? And that starts with you have to greet all tests with joy. All right, in James chapter 1, I know people love this verse. They love, they love reading this. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, patience, And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What James is saying here, when you break it down and you go back and you read it in the Greek, what he's saying is that it's kind of a play on words from verse 1. But what he's saying is, when trials come your way, greet them with joy. When they, your response to the trials is going to make the difference. It sets the tone for how this thing is going to go. So when, you, when trials come your way and then you go, oh, man, here we go again, and you meet them with groaning and complaining, oh, that's great because all you're going to do there is breed bitterness, resentment, 
in unbelief. But when your posture is that of joy, man, what an opportunity now that I get to go through this. God, I don't know why you chose me. I have no idea why you chose me, but you chose me for a reason, and I'm going to go through this. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to praise you throughout this whole entire process. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to do it. And when we do that, that's where joy comes. When we do it with that joy, that's where our faith comes from, because then we're able to see what God is doing. I was listening to this pastor. He was saying he was talking to this lady in his church, and she was saying that I pray for more trials because I grow so much during trials. And I was like, you all kind of crazy because I'm not, I don't, I don't want any additionals. Like, just give me what you have laid out for me, Lord, and nothing more. And if she wants it, she can have mine too. But you get to that place when you start to see how much you grow. Like, dang, man, my faith has really grown just by going through this stuff. Right? I mean, we look at our lives. We see everything that's going on in the world right now. And we just kind of get to that place where we're like, this is tough. But. God's been good. Like, if you ever been broke before and, and then you make it onto the other side, you're like, hey, man, being broke ain't that bad. I mean, it sucks. Don't get me wrong. But it's like when you've, when you've done it, it's different. Like, when you've seen it to the other side, when you've seen somebody get sick and survive it, that, means that, that makes a huge difference. Even when they don't, I've seen people get sick, not survive, but never lose their joy. And that's impressive to me. That's just a testament to their walk with the Lord. The next thing that we have to do is we have to be willing to sacrifice our promise. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. Because uh, somewhere along the way, we start to feel like we have to protect our promises from God. Like God is now the villain in the story. God is giving you these things, and now for some reason we feel like he's trying to take it away from us. Well, God told me that he was going to put me in a position to be financially stable and I was going to have money. But for some reason, he keeps saying the tithe. I ain't never going to be rich if he keeps taking my money from me, so I got to hide it. God told me that my kids are going to get saved. He told me that my kids are going to be blessed and that they're going to have great relationships. But right now, they're living some interesting lifestyles. They're making some poor decisions. And as a result, I'm not going to let go. And when I say let go of your kids, I say it as lovingly as I possibly can because I got three. All right? I say it as lovingly as I possibly can. This doesn't mean that you stop praying for your kids. It doesn't mean that you stop sending them Bible verses and books. And it doesn't mean that you stop sending them worship songs. Love you, Mom. But what I'm saying is you don't stop. You just take a step back and let God do his thing. And sometimes we stand in the way between God and what he's trying to get done. And I don't want to be in God's way of anything. So we have to learn how to move, sacrifice it, let it go. I trust you enough, God. I've seen you. You've been good. Please go do your thing. It's going to be hard for me. It's hard for us as parents to let our kids go out and struggle. And it's a fine line sometimes where we start saying, is this a God? Like, should I just let them go and and do this? Or should I have my hands on them? What should I do? And we just keep that time in prayer. A lot of us are trying to go through life praying as little as we often can, you know, as little as often, and then trying to get these massive results. And that's why we spend so much time confused. It's hard to trust somebody that you don't have a relationship with. If you're not spending any time with God, it is really hard to let things go and trust him with it. The more time you spend with them, the easier it is. Like I said, over 50 years, what we see with Abraham is Abraham went 50 years When he first got the promise, he grabbed Lot, wasn't supposed to, right? And he went, did some stuff in Egypt. But when 50 years later, after all the tests and the trials, and God said, give give me your son. He's like, yes, I'm ready. Let's go. I'm up first thing in the morning. We're making this three-day trip. Boom, let's do it. That's how much has changed. You have to stay consistent, though. Like I said, he's building altars all the time to the Lord. He's worshiping the Lord. He's responding immediately when the Lord calls. I know some of us like to drag our feet. The last thing that we need to learn how to do is we have to learn to trust the promiser, not the promise. All right, this is, a, this is a tough one because we get so fixated in what we're supposed to be getting that that's what we put all of our hope in, that's what we put all of our trust in, that's where everything, ha- that's where everything goes. And when we begin to focus more on the promise than we do the promiser, we're now idolizing it, whatever that is. It could, be something that, it could be something at work. God gave me this job, but now it seems like I might be on the fence. They might have me on my way out. I, I got to hang on to this thing because I worked hard for this job. God put me here. He put you there. He'll take you out of there and put you somewhere else. 
Focus on, focus on him. As long as you focus on him, everything's good. You focus on the promiser, and everything is good. When you take your eyes off him and you begin to focus on the promise, that's where things start going wrong. See, the way we get to this point, we see it in Hebrews. When we get done reading about all these heroes of the faith, this is how it wraps up. And it says, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God has provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. All these heroes that we talk about, they were all looking forward to the work of Christ. We have the privilege and honor to look behind us at the completed work of Christ and what he's done on the cross. And because of what he's done, that gives us the ability to live our faith out boldly like them. They didn't have, they didn't have, Abraham, he pops up on the scene in chapter 12 of the Bible. We have 66 books that we get to look at. 1,189 chapters that we get to read. He had like 11. And we're still talking about them. We have to get ourselves to that place where we start to say, I want to live this thing out loud. I want to live it boldly. I know it's hard because there's so much that I don't know. But it's okay to not know. It's okay. Just go with the process. Trust in God. See, I used to do this thing when I was in the, when I was in the academy is that we would do this thing. They called it round robin. And they would find like a really grueling task for us to do. Like, they'd have these 50-foot ladders. You had to climb the ladder with all your stuff on, go into a window, crawl through a maze, come out another window, and then go up another ladder, go through another maze, come down head first. And there's like 48 of us, right? And they would say, nobody ever wanted to go first. They'd say, there's a lot of grace for the people in the front, but there's high expectations for the people in the back. And this is not for me. I'm not putting pressure on us as believers. But what I'm saying is that for us, and when I was going through this process, if you were number 47, number 48, they're like, hey, you better not make any mistakes. There's grace. We know stuff happens. But it's like you had 47 people go in front of you. You should have figured some things out. You should have been paying attention. It's the same thing for us as believers. We've had a lot of people come before us. These aren't just significant events. These are real people that we're really going to meet one day, and these are their stories. No dun-dun, all right? We're going to go through this series, and I pray that you guys take this stuff to heart, all of us. I hope that we all take it to heart, and that we all start to say, how do I get to live my life out loud? How do I get to that point in my walk where I can start living like Abraham? And I'll tell you how. Worship team, you guys can come up. And it's the three, the three points that I told you guys. Greet every single test with joy. Doesn't matter what it is. Greet it with joy. Yes, what an opportunity. Thank you, God. And stay in, stay in communion with them. Stay talking to them. Don't, don't stop. Don't let your foot off the gas. Keep going. Be willing to sacrifice your promise. All right? Be willing to sacrifice it. Let it go. Don't force it. Let it go. Be okay with letting it go. And the biggest thing that we could ever do is trust the promiser, not the promise. Don't ever take your eyes off the Lord. Doesn't matter what you guys are going through. Doesn't matter what's going on around us. Do not take your eyes off the Lord. There are some great promises that he has in store for us. There are some amazing things that's going to happen in our lives, especially for us as parents. A lot of us as parents have spent countless hours praying for our kids. And when we kind of start to see them deviate off off the trail, we get really nervous. Trust God. Trust God. Stay on your knees for your kids. Keep praying for them. Lift them up in prayer. And let's look around at the world and begin asking, Lord, who do you want me to cover? Who should I be covering? As I look at the families that are losing loved ones in Ukraine and Russia, I just, there's so much going on. And I can't imagine being in one of these countries, even here, with no faith. And thinking, how am I going to survive this? How are we going to get through this? There's no food. There's, we can't call anybody. We can't get a hold of anything. Where are we going to go? Our family's been separated. What happens? Faith is all that's going to get you through. There's no amount of information that's going to give you true peace. Only God. Only God is going to be able to give you that true peace. And the only way that you're going to get that is by spending that time. And you got to learn how to trust him. 
you are going to constantly be tested in this life. It's a promise. We, it's a guarantee that we're going to be tested as we go through this. Embrace it. Enjoy it. Don't be so quick to get past it. See how God wants to work you and, and work things out of you at the same time. It's not all about money and stuff. It's just, just really our walks. Some of us just want to go deeper, and it's just going to require more. You're going to have to fight through the shingles. You're going to have to fight through the food poison. You're going to have to fight through your kids. Fight for what's important. I'm going to close this out in prayer. God, we thank you so much for who you are, for what you do, that we have the opportunity to come to you, Lord, with everything that we have. And God say, sometimes we don't get it. Sometimes we don't understand why we're going through it, but we're willing to go through it anyway. We've seen so many heroes of faith come before us, Lord, and you've given us an amazing blueprint on how to live our faith out loud, how to grow while we're being tested. None of that has changed. So God, thank you for your goodness, for your foresight to know that we were going to need this stuff, that we need this series, that we want our faith to grow We want to do better. We want to know more about you. Lord, I pray that as we go our separate ways this week, that this would not be the last time that we get into your word. That this would not be the last time that we spend time with you this week. God, help us to focus on you and not what you can do for us. This is not transactional. We don't want anything from you except your heart, Lord. That's it. Father, I pray that you would grow us in our faith during this series, that we would be a church, that we'd be a people who walk boldly and are unashamed of our faith, God, of our relationship with you. So, Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given us to be about your business. And I pray that these words would touch each of us and that you would work these words out in us. We thank you and we praise you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.